production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. This time on Broad and High. I'll try my hand at glass blowing with a visit to Glass Axis in Franklinton. Look at that! Then we'll head to Worthington to celebrate the homecoming of a treasured and historic instrument. This is something really worth restoring and not being made into a desk. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broaden High, I'm your host Kate Quickle, and I recently got a chance to visit the best place in Columbus to play with fire, the Hot Shop at Glass Axis in Franklinton. Tis the season for making holiday ornaments out of molten glass. Alex, so you're going to show me how to make a Christmas ornament, right? Absolutely, yes. Do I so need my, my protection? Put your safety glasses okay. on. Step one, uh -huh. always safety, safety first. first. Yes. What's next? All right, so we have all these colored glass chips in front of us. It's called Frit, F-R-I-T. And that is just pretty much the term we use for this broken up, uh, powdered or shattered glass. And that's how we're going to add our color Very today. Very cool. So we pretty much have the whole rainbow for you to choose from. I what, love it. What colors are you thinking? Oh man, I'm loving kind of this this whole blue column right mm. here, the blue and the white. That's that's pretty much everyone's favorite because it looks oh, like good. the ocean or right. the sky. Right, so gorgeous. Awesome. And so let's uh, go into the white to give us a nice bright base. Okay. And then we can sprinkle the other colors down and then we'll kind of swirl it around. It'll look really awesome. Love it. turn, just like you're picking up sprinkles on an ice cream cone. Love it. So right now we're great. It looks like we got color on the end. Okay. So we'll head to our left and we'll melt this in. Okay. Woohoo. OMG. You're a pro. Tell me where, oh, I'm going right here. Right there. So okay. set it down on those ball bearings first. Yeah. And then you can slide, slide just right inside the door. It keeps spinning? Always turning. Always spinning. Well, Glass Axis is a nonprofit glass art studio. We've been in Columbus for almost 30 years and we specialize in hot glass, warm glass, cold glass. Uh, in fact, we're in the top 10 internationally of glass art studios in the breadth and scope of all the different things that we teach. And now we can slide it out. We'll pick it up and we'll go get your blues. Okay. Look at that. But you can see all your color now sort of looks clear and orange. I don't want to touch you, oh God. Oh, I'll move. <laughs> So now you just kind of want to rest it on the table. Okay, like right before the... Right before the blue, and then just roll across it. Rolling, rolling, rolling. Okay, that looks perfect. Good. You got great coverage, Back let's go melt the, it in. Into the into fire. Into Mordor over here. <laughs> this is our raw material. We buy uh, a pallet of this. There's 2,000 pounds of this on a pallet. Um, and we charge it in that furnace and it heats it up to 2100 degrees. That runs mostly 24 seven year round. So our gas bill is a killer. All right, so it's almost melted in. Once it's nice and smooth, yeah. um, I can take it over and I'm gonna put your bubble in to get it started. All right. So am, am I sort of handing off? You're kind of handing off. Okay. And now you can cool down a second. Woo! Away from the heat. <laughs> All right, so now that I have that heat, we're gonna put some air in here. Okay. So I blow a little puff into the end and cap my finger on it. What that does is it traps the air inside my pipe and the air only has one place to go and that is to inflate the glass. Yes. Okay. 
Then, as we all know, hot air rises, so air likes to go where that heat is. It's right. going to go right in there, and you can see it rounding out. Yeah, that's incredible. All right, so the next step is you're going to actually blow this out. Okay. You're going to do the glass blowing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to heat this. I'll have you hold that. Okay. I'm going to heat it up so it's easy for us to work with. Okay. And I'll bring it back and set it down. Once I set down, you can slide that end on here. Uh huh. Small end in your mouth. Uh huh. And then if you want to stand about here, then you'll be able to watch it in place. Watch it in place. And so I'll just tell like you when. strong. Yeah, I breaths. say kind of like uh, the pressure it takes to whistle. Okay. I'm ready. And stop. Whoa, perfect. Look at that. So even before, it takes a little bit to get started, but then once that bubble inflates, it just goes. It goes. And it, goes quickly. it really does. You don't think it's doing anything, and then boom. So what I'm doing right now is I'm just kind of cooling down that constriction we made, and that causes really teeny mini micro fractures on the glass. Okay. So when I give it a little tap, it just pops the it vibration off. goes through it and it pops it off. Perfect. And now we're going to go add a hook so that you can hang this on your tree or in your garden or wherever you might want to place it. Here comes our blob that's going to become our hook. Then we're going to press it on, pull it back. Pull it up and loop it. Loop it. Perfect. Awesome. So let me just give it a second. Okay. To kind of solidify All itself because right. we have a short working time, but we want to make sure it's solidified. Absolutely. And then you can pick it up with this. All right. And we'll put it away. You can start to see all those colors come out. Look at that. Oh my God. That's amazing. We're doing our part uh, as we partner with uh, 400 West Rich and the Idea Foundry uh, to try to make the Franklinton Arts District more popular uh, for people to come down and see what we've got going here. Glass Axis offers all kinds of classes for first-time glass blowers, from paperweights and ornaments to glass beads and sculpted flowers. Check them out online at glassaxis.org. The Forte Piano was originally made back in the days of Beethoven and was played for intimate house concerts for the well-to-do or even royalty. Only three of these instruments exist in the United States, and one of them recently returned home to Worthington, Ohio, after undergoing an extensive restoration. Here's more. Masters like Haydn, Mendelssohn, and Schumann wrote not for the grand piano, but for a much smaller instrument. Meet the Trondlin Forte Piano. It's one of only 15 or so left in the world. This one lives at the Orange Johnson House in Worthington. Money has finally come together to fully restore it, a 16-month process. The last time I tuned it when everything was working was in 2005. And every, every time I tuned it, something mechanical started to fail. So it's somewhat like a violin or any like a Stradivarius or something, it needs to be played and it needs to be in condition to be played yes. in order to survive. Right. The instrument had been acquired in Europe. The owner of the instrument had had it strung with modern piano wire. Not a good thing. Not a good thing. If anybody had actually tried to play it, it might have imploded because yes. of the strength of the wire that was yeah. in it. Yes. The strength of the wire was based on a cast iron plate. Cast her that way. Turn this one this way. It was an instrument that I'd never heard of. So I was curious, number one. Okay, so 
who was this builder and just how good was his stuff. And it didn't take long to investigate the, between the keywork um, and the, uh, the casework, the design of the case and the, the material that was used in the veneer, uh, the cabinet work, uh, that this is something really worth restoring and not being made into a desk. The belly of the instrument. The belly on these instruments uh, is all the more significant because there's no cast iron plate holding the thing together. And so one, one assessment that I have to make is just how bad is the damage. If I bring tension back to the case, I don't want it to be any more destructive uh, than it has been. The inner workings of the action is actually, in my view, probably the most critical. Even if the belly isn't fully repaired, uh, tone may suffer, um, but the part that is unseen in the instrument, that really makes the piano or not. So as a restorer, I'm looking at what's there. Um, I want to make it I want to make all the specifications as close as I can to what was there originally, but in as much as possible, leave the original material there as a document that can be studied later on. And it's a conversation that you can have with artists and craftsmen from, from years ago. And, and it's a conversation that fewer and fewer people are speaking. So I feel like it's a, uh, it's a language that's being lost unless someone keeps the language alive. The very first notes came when David Brightman, Oberlin's Director of Historical Performance, stepped into the studio to record a fundraising CD to benefit the Worthington Historical Society. The first concert was staged recently at the Orange Johnson House. And it's like um, going back to the source somewhere, yes. The source of um, what the composers heard and imagined. It's very important to, uh, to play such piano because it enlightens uh, about the intentions and, uh, of the composers. The touch is very shallow. When you play a key, it descends to about half the depth of a modern instrument. So it's very easy to play. It makes some things in the literature which are nearly impossible to play on a modern instrument possible. Look for upcoming concerts with the newly restored Trondlin Forte Piano on the Facebook page of the Worthington Historical Society. Just down the street from the Orange Johnson House is another local treasure, one that pays tribute to the most important of childhood playthings, dolls. Well, it's a wonderful collection of 19th century dolls and has some very unusual dolls that can't be seen in many other places at all. And together, it's a nice little jewel. We get all kinds of cheers from doll collectors, but we get a lot of oohs and ahs from kindergartners too. <laughs> well, the earliest ones are the ones that uh, were made of wood in Germany. The Germans were the toy makers for the Western world initially, so we have some very early small ones that we call penny woodens or peg woodens, and we have some portrait dolls, some china dolls, some Parian china dolls. Um, the French fashions are 
probably the elite of this group. And then we have some American dolls that were made by Isanna Walker and Joel Ellis, people that are big names in American doll making early on. A portrait doll is a doll that is made in the image of a real person. So for all the kids who come here and have American Girl dolls, there are wonderful stories about these dolls, but they weren't real people. The dolls over there uh, include the Empress Eugenie, who was married to Napoleon III, the Kaiserin Augusta von Weimar, the Empress of Germany, and there's Countess Dagmar, whom we associate with the Tsar of Russia. Um, and there's Alice in Wonderland, too, who, even though she's a, a literary character, reflects a real person's life. So those are the ones we typically have the kids looking for. The Alice kind of shocks them because she doesn't look like Disney's Alice. A Parian doll uh, refers to the Parian marbles that were being used for sculpture at that time. And so they will have pierced ears, sometimes they'll have an embellishment. They were fired twice and therefore much more expensive than the China dolls that have the very shiny faces. We have a wishbone doll, and the wishbone doll is the earliest Worthington doll that we have. And uh, it was made on a turkey wishbone. So it was found floating in the mud of the cellar of the Orange Johnson house at the time that the society uh, was going to restore the house. These are the French fashion dolls, and they are the fanciest ladies on the block. Um, these dolls had every stitch of clothing that a lady of fashion would want to be wearing in Paris. This is uh, the lady's uh, toiletry case, and so it's made out of leatherette with little uh, mother of pearl decorations, and inside is all of the items that might be needed if you're going traveling. Your perfume bottles, your bath sponge, Kids always like to know that this is a 140-year-old bar of soap. And uh, here we have the brushes, which includes her lice comb, which every lady would be needing in that time period. And the fun thing is to look at the label on the back and notice that it's from the toy store Onam Bleu, um, which is still in existence in Paris today. The Isana Walker is the treat and the treasure of the doll museum. Um, she is a beautiful doll. She was made by a lady doll maker named Isanna Walker, and she made these cloth dolls uh, that she fashioned herself, and her sister hand painted them. So everything about the doll is original, from her dress to her little red shoes and all the things she wears underneath. The Isanna Walker dolls are very treasured among American doll collectors. And she's very sweet. Her name is Thankful, and it's just a wonderful name for this beautiful little doll. We sometimes have doll houses. We have a huge dollhouse collection. We also have uh, any number of other e exhibitions that are sometimes borrowed from other collectors in the area. And in this case, uh, ones that are from our collection with a collector's dolls are being displayed. And it kind of allows us to look at one facet at a time. Uh, occasionally someone will call us and they'll have a treasured item that they would like to see preserved and shared. And so if it fits in our collection, which does go into the 20th century now, but uh, if it fits in our collection, then it comes and it's on permanent vacation here. Our next story crosses countries as well as cultures as one family in Mexico strives to maintain its ancestral tradition of weaving. So each piece tells a story. We call this the cycle of life. Each step from the day we're born, each step represents each stages of our lives. So here, these are the stages. Here's where we inquire all the knowledge and wisdom, and we inherit that to our kids and they begin their own life. My village is called Teotitlan del Valle, which means a place of God. 
This small village, it's in the uh, state. It's in the state of Oaxaca. So this village, the historians believe that um, it was one of the first village that was created by the Zapotec Indians hundreds and thousands of years ago. So I, I grew up playing with the bobbins, with the paddles on the loom, spinning wheel. That was really our, our fun thing doing as, as a kid. The fact that I'm a, I'm a, a Zapotec uh, weaver or Zapotec artist, what I'm sharing, it's not just about my work. I'm sharing and I'm preserving an ancient tradition. And I want everybody to know. A lot of um, artists use paint, use music, uh, writers to express themselves. I use textiles of what my father taught me when I was 12 years old. I use that to express myself. So you collect your plant dyes, you dye the yarn. This can take several days or weeks, depends on the plant you're working with. For instance, pomegranate will give you a light yellow just a fruit, right? Chop it off, we'll give you a light yellow. Same fruit, you dry it out, you put it on a metal tub to run for several weeks, now it'll give you black. So it takes weeks before you can get there. So that's why I mentioned that some of these dyes can take days or sometimes weeks. So you have got an idea, you look at your color palettes, you sketched your designs. Once you start looking at this type of art form, not just as a rug, but as an art form, that's when you start to want to have a personal expression. That's where you recognize who you are as a, and as an individual, as an artist, as an artisan, as a native Zapotec from Oaxaca, Mexico, which is so important to me. I want to express that in every step of my art. So with that in mind, you, I sketch the design, how I want to look, I color it. Um, from there, then it goes to the loom. The design would tell me how this weaving will be placed, will be woven on the loom. I have to take into consideration of what the loom is allowing me to do. And, also, and then from there, I have to go around the limitations of the loom so I could create the design that I'm visualizing. That consists in thread per inch, the width of the yarn, and the size of the loom. Whether the loom, if I'm working in a, 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 a small piece, some of my pieces are woven sideways. When it's done, it's presented the other way. So when you're weaving these, your mind, it's kind of thrown away because you're, you're looking at this design as you're weaving it a certain way. When you're done with the weaving, it's exhibit in a different way, which that's what I originally wanted to do. I feel like I have the, uh, the tools for me to educate the world about my art. You mentioned that it's, it, it's something that's disappearing. The synthetic dye has in, has, uh, was introduced in my village in around the 1850s. The villagers rapidly abandoned their, uh, their ancient tradition of working with plants, minerals, and insects. It's easier and it's cheaper to do. So mass-produced market came along and um, there is no more true soul to each piece. Then it becomes a product. So they lost touch with our tradition. They lost touch with, and, and I think they lost their respect perhaps for my tribe because you're not they're not honoring our ancestors through their technique through the methods through 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 just through the way the whole piece is being created they lost it so many generations ago they don't practice that no more everything's chemi chemically died so we're the last few families in the village Teotitlan del Valle that still have the knowledge and are committed enough to create each piece, and each piece we honor those true artisans or artists that started, that did all the research. And how will a beetle will give you red? Someone had to do that. 
and my ancestors did it more than 2,000 years ago. We're proud to still have the knowledge and we're proud to honor those people through each piece we create. I'm just in love with my culture and, and I love what I do and I love to represent the Zapotec community as much as I can and, uh, and hopefully my uh, forefathers are looking down on me and be proud of what I do. That's our show. You can see all of today's stories at WOSU.org and be sure to check us out on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. We're closing the show today with an original Christmas song by Portsmouth native Steve Free. From all of us here at Broad and High, have a joyful holiday season. We'll see you back here with all new episodes in 2017. Friends and family gather near this Christmas day. Sounds of the season fill the air. Time for giving, time to share. There is goodwill everywhere. It's Christmas day. We will laugh and we will sing. All the bells in church will ring. To the world we will proclaim it's Christmas day. Lift your voices to the sky as the angels sing on high. Let your soul and spirit fly. It's Christmas Day, a time to praise the Lord above. Let your heart be filled with love. A message on a snow white dove. It's Christmas. Day. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at ColumbusMakesArt.com.